Welcome to this Edge Church podcast. We are a people whose mission is to know Christ, be the church, and serve our community. We pray you are blessed and equipped by this message. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. It's great to be with you this morning. And uh, a big welcome to all our campuses online today and those watching this service today. And it's an absolute privilege every time to come and share the Word of God. You know, we are a very privileged people because we know the end from the beginning. See, we talk at Christmas, but really Christmas takes us to the resurrection that makes Christmas all possible. And uh, we divide those times of the year, but those stories are so well attached together and we can rejoice at Christmas because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's, it is good to be with you. I've just come back from South Africa, been there for two weeks. And um, it's just so amazing to me that in the midst of such sadness, Uh, to see a nation where there's such extreme poverty and yet so much wealth. And it seems like there's no in between, you know, there's, there's one or the other facing each other, sometimes in the same street. And it's hard to get your head around that. But probably the sad thing for me, having been there for over seven years, last time I was there was just after our own journey of grief as a family. And uh, it was a very emotional time for me to be there and haven't been there since because of my cancer journey and then COVID. And to go back and in one way, be so heartbroken at how many lives were lost over there through COVID and families in the church that had lost loved ones and families that I knew. And uh, it was a very moving experience. And yet the resilience of the church, the incredible sense of the church rising. Pastor Andre was here not that long ago and it was his church that I went to both in Johannesburg and Durban and over 14,000 people in church on Sunday. Uh, The place is the same spirit we have here at Edge and they've just continued from the day we met 40 years ago. They've just continued to do the same things over and over again of sharing the Gospel, bringing hope to a broken world and to see thousands and thousands worshipping Jesus, some in the midst of their pain, some in the midst of going really well. And every service while we were worshipping, in every service, over 100 people being baptised as we're worshipping. And I came back um, really excited about the fact that the church is the answer to a broken world. It really, really is. And so I'm very, very excited. I am jet lagged, so the dad jokes don't get better. Uh, My wife asked me, why don't you treat me like you did when we first were dating? So I took her to dinner and a movie and then I dropped her off at her parents. (laughs) Yesterday I purchased a world map. I gave my wife a dart and said to her, throw it and wherever it lands, I'm taking you for a holiday. Turns out we're gonna spend three weeks behind the fridge. So (laughs) there you go. (laughs) Anyway, here we go. This morning, I believe I have a very simple message, but a message that's been very, very powerful in my own life and a message that I believe God wants to prepare us with today as we go into a new year next year. I believe God is doing so much in His church. I call it the upside down kingdom. God is turning things upside down and He's making His priority our priority. And I'm very excited about the future. But before I share that, as I walked into the prayer meeting this morning, I sensed a a prophetic word that God wants to take us right now into divine preparation. And that divine preparation is gonna come from a fresh illumination of His Word. So God is wanting to prepare, not just Ed Church, but the body of Christ, but I specifically feel for us as a church with a fresh illumination for a fresh activation. And I believe the best days of the church are ahead. I believe we're moving into incredible days. But before I even open up the message, I really sense that, God wants people during this service today and both these services to whatever shared for you to receive peace today. There are some of you in the room and you've had a restlessness in your heart, in your life, and God wants to fill you with peace, but He also wants you to experience 
the fact that He's gonna be present with you. I've shared this many times about my own story that when I was diagnosed with cancer, the three things that came were God's peace, the sense that He was present, but the third I wasn't ready for and that was His purpose never leaves our lives. And there's people in the room today, you're confused about your purpose. And in that confusion, you're not sure whether God's present and you've lost a sense of peace. Can we just bow our heads just for a moment and over in the UK and where else? If you're in that position this morning, I wanna pray for you right now before I go to a short word this morning, but I wanna pray for those of you that are really needing God's peace right now. You're needing to know that He's with your decision-making and you need clarity in your current purpose. I'd like you to slip up your hand wherever you are across the room. Thank you, thank you. Many, many hands. Lord Jesus, thank You today. You're our Dad. Thank You that You care about us and thank You that You were here before we got here. And thank You, Lord, that You are preparing us today to receive that peace. May people not leave this room today without that inner knowing of Your peace. The fact You're with them and You're not gonna let them go and that Your purpose will be fulfilled I pray in Jesus' awesome Name, Amen, Amen. The title of my message today is called Living Called. Do you know we are all as Christians meant to live called? And I think one of the things that's gonna change in the future is that ministry is not just what happens on a platform, but God wants all of us to have a platform and that platform is not a stage, but that platform is knowing that we are living called by God in every area of our lives. I wanna start with an unusual passage of Scripture. It's a passage of Scripture that when I was in hospital having chemo, I felt challenged by God to study the book of Acts. And what I did is I wrote a commentary on every chapter of the book of Acts and I, I found myself seeing things I'd never seen before. For example, in, in chapter one, it talks about the upper room and, and the people gathering to receive the Holy Spirit. And I had this weird thought, might have been the chemo, but the thought was that um, if we had an upper room today, we would have bus tours to the upper room. If we had an upper room today, we'd have upper room cups for sale. We would have people come and see where it all happened. We would have drive past over there. That's where it happened in that room. And while that's not totally wrong, the upper room was never to be a place to be celebrated on its own, but it was a place that was a sending place for us to then go out and change the world. And a lot of the time, the modern church, even the modern church of today, does most of its work at events where you come to the event. We put on the event and rather than go, it's come. And God is turning the come around to go. So we still come and we need to come and we need to be fueled, and we need to be uh, uh, affected by the Holy Spirit's work and, and equipped. But we need to be equipped for a purpose and that is to live called. In Acts chapter eight, verses one to eight, Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning, but Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But this is the verse that grabbed me when I was doing this study. But the believers who were scattered, not gathered, the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. And I felt the Holy Spirit in hospital say to me, the church has to have an everywhere we go. Not an everywhere we come. Wherever they went, now you would think, Christians being persecuted, thrown into prison, Stephen murdered, that we'd say, I think I've had enough of Christianity. I think I'm done with this. Do you know how many Christians over the last few years say, I'm over it. I've been working in a church for three years where young people have come to me and said to me, it just doesn't do it for me anymore. You know, I've been there, done that, bought the T-shirt, know what's happening in worship, know we're gonna have three songs, no, we're gonna have some announcements and then we're gonna hear about all these miracles that never happen. That's what I've been told. So we are deconstructing, we're over all this. I wanna tell you until the church has an everywhere we went, 
Unless the church has an everywhere we go, it can't all happen in the gather. The gather has to equip for the scatter. And I believe God's preparing us for something very, very powerful. But we've got to have this whole understanding that we are called to live called. I believe we're moving into a chapter of the church where we see the empowerment of the church, where believers live by conviction that we are called to live for the cause of Jesus Christ on earth. I've always said, I don't serve the church. I serve Jesus Christ through the church. A lot of people get disillusioned with church because they only serve the church. But we're not called to serve the church. We're called to serve Jesus Christ through the church with our God shape that God called us to activate in our lives and live called. Some people live for provision. Some people live for prosperity. But the people that experience the greatest joy in life, even non-Christians, is those that live for purpose. I have friends that are very wealthy, uh, Italian relatives in the city, some of them with the best houses you can buy, the multiple uh, latest model cars, and they are depressed because they live for prosperity. There's more than provision there, but there's no purpose. And I believe when you look at the world around us, even non-Christians that don't have a faith in Christ, people retire and they go looking for somewhere to volunteer because when they volunteer, they find a purpose. If you're not doing anything, you don't enjoy your retirement and a lot of people die early deaths because they've lived all their lives with a sense of purpose and now they think they're gonna have this whole holiday time of their lives. But if there's no purpose, there's a sadness that comes with that. And so I really believe that as Christians, we're moving into an era where we all believe we're called and we all live called. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 29, David was asked by his father to take food out to his brothers that were in the middle of a battle with Saul, you know, against Goliath. And the father gave him cheese and food and said, take this out to your brothers. And when he went out to visit the brothers, the brothers made fun of him. There's lots of reasons they didn't like him. Some commentaries say he was a half brother. For whatever reason, there was this disdain towards their beloved brother from the father, David, and they had a go at him. What, you've left those sheep all on their own? You're useless, you're not doing your duty at home. What are you doing coming out here to watch us in the battle? You know, we often judge people by what's inside of us. And you know, these guys were not judging David. David was sent by his dad and he put the sheep in the hand of carers. He didn't do anything wrong. But what David said when he saw this lack of dealing with the issue of Goliath, he said these few words in the King James Version, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Something changes in our lives when we get hold of a cause. Now in our world today, people are getting, giving first class allegiance to second class causes. And we see that all around us and it's really sad. You know, people dying for the climate change conversation. One good look at the Bible and we could really find some answers about that, but we don't wanna look at the Bible, but we won't go into that conversation. But people get passionate, vegans versus meat eaters. You know, people placarding in front of restaurants because they're cooking meat. And at one stage we were all getting excited about the national anthem, about not being young and free, but strong and free. And people love to get hold of a cause. People get got hold of good causes like dealing with slavery and poverty. And some people like to save certain animals from extinction, extinction, cancer research. And we can get hold of causes. And that's okay. But I wanna tell you as Christians, we have the greatest cause on earth. And no matter what persecution, no matter what comes our way, no matter what ups and downs we go through, even in church life, there's nothing greater than the cause of Jesus Christ. A cause gives us purpose. It makes us passionate. It positions us with like-minded people and it prioritises our world for us, even though there is a price, there's great pleasure even if there's pain in living out the cause of Jesus Christ. When I handed over this church uh, nine years ago, 
There was a part of me that thought I would have an easier life, a more relaxed life, won't have to do the running around of church infrastructure, which wasn't my highest gift. But the interesting thing, and I want this so much for young pastors, young leaders, young Christians, is that what I did when I left, I clarified the cause of my calling. And so I've spent the last nine years 90% of the time in my calling, in my gift. So I do feel I'm retired. I've retired. I told you a couple of weeks ago, I got four new tyres, so I've retired. And, And I'm keeping on going because I'm not working a day in my life if I'm living for the cause. If I'm working for the cause of Jesus Christ, it's not staying alive. Some people thought he's keeping busy to deal with his pain and his loss. And that's, I think not fair on God to say that because my God who was born and we celebrate Christmas, but died for me, He's worthy of my full allegiance. But if I embrace my calling in His cause, I will never burn out because I'm burning on in the cause of Jesus Christ and it fulfills my life. Each Christian should live called. Every Christian leader should live called. It's not a career, it's a calling. Every church should live called. I remember the day when God supernaturally spoke to my heart about starting a conference called Edge Conference. Many of you would have been part of that. Some of you are not aware of it and that's okay. It was a season back then. And God put it into my heart to start a conference that would encourage pastors and leaders that were tired and burnt out and feeling like they weren't sure whether they were doing the right role, that they could come here and be refreshed. I remember the story one day of a lady who came from Tasmania. I think, Karen, you remember the story. A lady that came from Tasmania, her and her husband were about to resign the church. She was downstairs having food and she was on a diet and there was all this rich food. And she said to one of the girls that was serving, uh, you know, I, don't, I can't eat that food. And, 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 and she says, what would you like? What can you eat? And she goes, that's okay, that's okay. I can wait till afterwards. No, no, please. She says, I'd just like a ham sandwich and, and an apple. And so what happened, this young lady serving here went and found the food, brought it to her. But the thing that was most powerful is that the young lady waited for this pastor's wife to finish eating the apple. She took the core and she put it in a serviette and and, and the lady was embarrassed. She goes, I can throw it out. And she goes, no, no, it's my pleasure. And then we get an email when she gets back to Tasmania with her husband. It said, we came to the conference feeling like we've had it. And then the act, I thought she was gonna say, you're preaching, Pastor Danny really changed me, but that didn't come. A young lady that held an apple core that just went out of her way to get her the sandwich that she could eat. And she goes, at that moment, I realised we needed to get over our pain and we decided not to resign. That young lady may not even know today that she was instrumentally used by God in her God shape to bring about a breakthrough in someone's life. Because as a church, we discovered at that time, what was our calling? You know, what has God put us here to do? Seven postures of the called. They're very simple, they'll probably go up on screen. But called people, number one, are consecrated to the call. It's a consecration, not an obligation. I never ever thought I'd live to see the day, not here at Edge, but in church world, and it could happen here too, where people who have been on staff in churches, people that have worked in places are so burned out and wanting to sue churches for the way they've been treated. I never thought I'd live to see that day. And I believe that's wrong on both sides where leaders use people to fulfil their dream rather than us as leaders discovering what the gift is on someone's life What is the God shape? This is what God's changing in the world right now, that we don't have churches that have holes that need to be plugged. If I can divert for a minute and say, Edge Church, as we move into our future, we cannot rush to plug holes. What we have to do is put people in their God roles because that'll last us for a lifetime 
If people live called because they are consecrated to what they know they are called to do. So that people of um, people called people that are called live consecrated to the call. It's not duty or obligation, but devotion and revelation. It's heart before the head, before the hands. He's not the landlord, he's the Lord of Lords. We're not here to work for the landlord and then get a raw deal from the landlord. We're here to serve the Lord of Lords and He's not into burning out His kids. No matter what we go through, when we live according to His purpose, we will have His peace and we will carry His pleasure. Called people, number two, are committed to the call through obedience. See, a lot of people get confused between submission and obedience. And they think obedience is just doing what leaders tell us to do. And that's dangerous. But submission is, I see the mission. I see the call. And I wanna bring myself under that call and under that mission because my God shape in partnership with everybody else's God shape will make that mission come to pass and we won't burn out, we'll burn on and we'll have joy at the end of it and there'll be plenty left over. Number three, Called people have clarity of the call through revelation. I think I've already mentioned that. Not through reason, but through revelation and illumination of the call. I was gonna say this later, but I'll share it now because I can't wait to get to it. But in my early 20s, I was working in a menswear store in Victoria Square Arcade, but my heart had been changed by God. Sharon and I were running a home group and people were coming through our home. Uh, Hundreds and hundreds, Pastor Dave Peterson was working with us and we would fast on Wednesdays and these kids would come into our home and we were running a home group when home groups didn't exist. And uh, a man called Yongi Cho, the largest church in the world, came to Australia and talked about the power of home gatherings and we were asked to run one in our home. And and during this time, there's so many stories I could tell you, but God supernaturally showed up in our home. And uh, I'm working in a menswear and somehow my heart's shifting. It's not like I wanna be a pastor one day or I I wanna be a top dog in the church. No, my heart shifted. And instead of wanting to build a business, I wanted to reach out to people. Lunchtime every day, four guys, we used to go to Pilgrim Uniting Church in Flinders Street. We used to go up to the attic and we would pray for God to use us. We prayed so loud because in those days we were taught that's how you prayed passionately, that we got kicked out of the church. So the Uniting Church kicked us out because we were praying too loud and we were upsetting the bingo thing that was happening downstairs. And so imagine getting kicked out of a church for praying, but there you go. And I'm in the menswear store. And one day, Pastor Freddie Evans came to visit me. Pastor Andrew Evans had been talking to me, who later became my spiritual dad, and said, I believe God is shifting your heart. There is a call of God on your life and you need to pray about it. I remember the happy, scared moment. I felt... I think this is God, I believe it's God, but how are we gonna eat? How are we gonna pay the bills? And back then, if you gave your life to serve God, you didn't know what you were gonna be paid. Uh, True, Andrew, we didn't know how we were gonna live. And I remember getting on the bus. And in those days, when you got on a bus and got a bus ticket, there was always a saying on the back of the ticket. And I turned my ticket around and it said, whatever's around the corner, God's already there on the bus ticket. I then sat down on the bus and was reading my Bible consistently and you know, in an organised devotional way. And my scripture that night on the bus was Isaiah 41, nine, do not fear, I've called you. Do not worry when you go through the waters, I'll be there. That was good because I can't swim. So it was really, really good. But uh, I knew God was calling me. And a journey began that day that, still keeps me going today. And a few months ago, I was preaching at Life Christian Centre in the city and I shared in another message, but I shared this story. And the guy who was the best man at our wedding was sitting in the congregation. And a few days later, he sent me this book. And this book is called Talking Tickets. 
And it's the story of the guy who wrote those sayings on the back of bus tickets. And they wrote a book about it called Talking Tickets. The ticket that I got that day, which would have been, you know, I would have been in my early 20s, I'm 67 now. And the ticket I got that day is here in the book. Whatever awaits you around the corner, God is already there. Now this book is put together about the life of the man who wrote these uh, sayings on the back of tickets. In the early 1940s, a very wealthy businessman he was here in Adelaide asked God in his words, what's my God shape? What am I called to do? I don't feel called to be on a platform and preach. And God put it in his heart to write sayings that would go back on, on the tickets on horse and cart, trams, eventually buses and trains. So 920,000, sorry, between 920,000 and 990,000 travellers read the slogans every week. What a congregation. But this book tells stories of people getting on the tram in Victoria Square on their way to Glenelg to commit suicide. And then they would get on the tram and get the ticket and read what was on the back of the ticket and they turned their lives around and miracles happened. A man who most of you have never heard of, a man who could have just lived for prosperity. Can you imagine how much that would have cost back then? And he's dead and gone and someone's found all those stories and put this book together, Talking Tickets. I'm so grateful today that living out our God shape is not a position at a church, even though for some that might be the calling. For me, it was. But right now I work with a carpet company and what do I do? I bring my God shape. I work with non-Christian business people and I bring my God shape. And if every one of us can discover, and I believe in the next month or so, one of my things I'd love to do here at Edge is just to help us understand how to personally discover our God shape. Because if we do that, my friends, this is not a deep theological message. Yes, it's deep though. It's deep because if we get hold of what God's calling us to do, the good thing is we will celebrate the call. One of the Scriptures I didn't read at the beginning, right at the beginning is, um, where are we? I, Psalm 40 verse 8. I take joy in doing Your will, my God, for Your instructions are written on my heart. Can you imagine living like that? And yes, you go through pain. You go through times of doubt. When our son passed away, I went to great doubt but I also didn't step into unbelief. And the reason being is because when you live in your call, there will be God's stamp on your call all through your life so that I could stop and say, what happened when I drove down South Road and I saw the Ranella Markets and God says, that's your building. What happened when you were on that bus that day? Whatever's around the corner, God's already there. What happened at the age of 11 when you received a full baptism of the Holy Spirit? What happened and all of a sudden, as I've said from this platform before, I could live with the I don't knows in my life because of all the I do knows in my life. But that happens when we live called. I think one of the worst experiences in life is just being a church attender because It'll be one good sermon one Sunday, not so good the other, worship went a bit long or this. And what happens is like the people in the grandstands during a game of sport, they know what should be happening on the field. And I think, and I'm so grateful that Edge is not doing that right now, but imagine with what we're going through as a church, you know, people say, oh, that should happen, this should happen. No, no, no. When we live cold, the church is not the or in our life, it's the and in our life. And as we all bring our God shape, we all help move forward into all that God has because we will see the completion of the call. Call people finish the assignment given to them by God. Some of you used to tell me off every now and then because I used to say from this platform, I'm one decision away from becoming a total idiot. And you go, don't say that about yourself, Pastor Daddy. Don't be so negative. But the fact of the matter is just one decision. Just one decision can turn us into a direction 
that was never God's plan for our lives. So my desire is not a good week, not just a good day, but a called life that can say like the Apostle Paul in Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. Do you know only one in six leaders in the Bible finish strong? When you look at the life of David, he finished, but the messes that happened in his life with his family and everything else, and it's so sad. The grace of God got him through because he kept saying, search me, O God. If there's anything in me, just go for it. I think as Christians, we should have a daily posture of God, go for it. If there's anything in me you need to adjust, please do it. Because I wanna finish, not just finish, I wanna finish strong. I wanna remain faithful and I want to run my race. Do you know, there are three evidences and I want the musicians to come, thank you. There are three evidences of being a follower of Jesus that I see in Scripture, I'm sure there's more, but these are very, very clear. An evidence of being a disciple of Jesus is number one, love. Number two, fruit. And number three, continuance or continuing all the way. In John 13, 34, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, by the love you have one for another. In my work with churches and working around this country, sometimes it's getting back to this, in conflicting situations. Hey guys, you can have differences of opinion, but love one another. Love one another in the difference. Unity starts when agreement stops, if it's not unbiblical behaviour, of course. But opinions, we all have them. They're like armpits. We all have them and they smell. But anyway, we will move on. Love is an evidence of being a follower of Jesus. Number two is fruit. You see in John 13, 34, by this shall all men know you're my disciples by the love. But in John 15, 8, it says people will know you're my disciples by your fruit. Sometimes the world listens to our toot, but they don't see our fruit. The world is sick of the talk. They wanna see the walk. I was in the prayer meeting and I turned to Papa Joe and I said, people want the glow, not the show. They want the cloud, not the crowd. When Moses came down from the mountain, he didn't have a show, he had a glow. The good thing about when we walk in our God shape, you won't know you got the glow. People will notice it. It's not, look at me, I've got this gift, you know. You need to submit to my vision because I got this gift. No, the people that have the glow don't know. Moses had the glow, but he didn't know, but the people saw it. And I really believe with all my heart today that we're moving into one of the most exciting eras for the church where we are not getting people to help us out, but we're unlocking people into their God shape. And then you can be a great doctor, you can be a great teacher. My wife is sitting here this morning and she has officially retired. She's a school teacher and the school don't want her to retire. She won't retire. She'll just do it another way. She just doesn't want to do all the homework to get ready for the, you know, all the studies to keep her teachers, but she'll find a way because her God shape is children and she will never ever be able to stop that. People run up to, people, we're in the shopping centre, they run up to her. They don't run up to me. Hey, Mrs G. She's watching them grow up and she used to teach them when they were little. Why? Because she stayed in her calling and God shape. I remember the time I stood on this platform. Sharon and I had been away on a trip. I'm being very open. She might tell me off when we get home, but that's okay. I'll just give her the darts to throw on the fridge and we'll see. We spent three weeks behind the fridge, but um, we went on a trip preaching. One of the pastors from here came with me and Sharon's in the back seat and we're talking shop all the way. I wasn't gonna share any of this, but here we go. And 
we got home and I said, did you enjoy that? She goes, nah. And I go, well, you won't come with me, but then I'm away a lot. And you know, what do we do? And the Holy Spirit rebuked me. He said, don't become a passionate Italian right now. Get all worked up. And I said to Sharon, why don't you go and pray and ask God what it is that He's put you on the planet to do? What? She goes, really? She didn't think I would accept her decision because uh, it was just crazy. You know, at 46 years of age to decide to go to university. She came back a couple of weeks later. She goes, I've prayed and God wants me to be a school teacher. She goes, I want to go to Tabor College because she'd done Bible college for a year or so or two and she could get some time off for the course and do it at Tabor, but it's going to cost $11,000. We didn't have the money, but I said, we'll find a way. We were living at Farnsworth Drive here down the road at Woodcroft. And we're having dinner one night and there's a knock at the door. A little kid comes running up to the door, hands me an envelope and runs back to the car. I couldn't get back to the car quick enough to see who the parents were. Open the envelope, $6,000. A few nights later, it happened again. Somebody else turned up at the house, $5,000. The exact amount, Sharon went to college and the rest is history. Why? Living called. Living called. Nothing comes close. And it's not about just serving at church. Can you imagine teachers living called, policemen living called, nurses living called, psychologists. Boy, do we need Christian psychologists right now. Thank you, thank you. Oh, this one here, right there, <laughs> right here. You know, sometimes people like Dee going and doing what she does. When she used to work at church, you think, oh, is that a demotion? No, it's a promotion to be able to use your God shape to help people that are broken. There's a little cafe that I go to, time's gone. And there's a young lady in this cafe just covered in tattoos. Probably not the sort of person I would choose to have long conversation with. Sorry to me for saying that, my prejudice. But I felt God say, keep saying positive things to her. Well, she left that cafe and I didn't see her again until last night. So you're talking six months now. And last night I went to a musical, Christian musical and had Scott McBain with me. I'm still working on him. And I said, come, I'll take you out to dinner. And we went out to dinner and that girl was working in this new place. She ran across and just hugged me. I've missed you, I've missed you, I've missed you. I'm not saying this to be self-promoting today but it's called living cold. It's sitting in a cafe and the Holy Spirit going, reach out there. Reach out there. I meet with six non-Christian business people every Friday. One of them's in hospital right now. So I ring him. I said, you know, I'm praying for you. He goes, really? I said, yeah. I said, how are you feeling? He said, I'm scared. I'm scared. So I began to give him the story of God's peace. He says, can we have a coffee when I get out of hospital? So was I on duty that day? You know, or was it my day off that day? No, we live cold. And in living cold, there is a pleasure that comes. There's a freedom that comes. There's a joy that comes. You don't even have to defend yourself, but you just stay on point and stay in your call. And Father, today, I pray for our Edge family. And I pray that You will stir in our hearts today a real sense that You're taking us somewhere into the future with a clarity of our call. That all of us in this room can wake up every day and know that we're on the planet on purpose for a purpose. But Father, let the joy of our salvation, let the joy of who You've made us to be become real to us today. Let us leave this place not with pessimistic whatever will be, but with a hope a freedom and an illumination of Your Word today that we can all live called and experience great breakthrough and purpose in our lives. I pray in Jesus' Name. Amen. Bless you, church. Bless you. Thanks for joining us today. Find more resources and discover what's next for you at edgechurch.com.